Ooh boy, Jephthah and his daughter. We have some family systems drama here, folks. In Judges 11, we meet Jephthah, who is son of Gilead, and his mom was a prostitute. And that part of his identity, he just can't seem to shake. He has a chip on his shoulder because every time he dreams big or wants to rise in station, there's somebody there to knock him down a peg or two and say, wasn't your mom a whore? So he's been trying to prove himself his whole life and he feels like he has to work twice as hard as everyone else to get half as far. Well, by, by halfway through this chapter, he has risen in station and he is the head of an army and it's time to attack the Ammonites. He makes a deal with God and says, if we can win this battle, if you will give the Ammonites into my hands, I promise that I will sacrifice as a burned offering whatever comes out of my house to greet me when I return home. I mean, we've all bargained with God before, so I don't mean to be too judgy about this, but that's risky. Whatever comes out of my house, so it needs to be a movable object. Maybe he was expecting a chicken or a dog or a walking coffee table, but what he actually gets when he gets home after victory is his one and only child, his beloved daughter. She runs outside to greet him, happy to see him, and he immediately starts lamenting. And just like in so many stories and settings of patriarchy, the male character has big feelings that he doesn't know what to do with so he transfers them on to the female character and makes her deal with them and be responsible for them. So he projects onto his daughter, oh daughter, what have you done to me? Look what I'm going to have to do now. I can't believe that this is my fate and fortune. Um, she's remarkably calm and accommodating in the story, which I think is suspicious. <laughs> She seems to understand that her dad needs to keep his promise to God and she will be sacrificed as a burnt offering for this victory on the battlefield. But um, she has a clause in her rider. She says, Dad, before you do that, please let me go into the wilderness of the mountains for two months to wail and mourn my virginity I will never get to be a woman in this life. I will never lie with a man. Let me bring my female companions with me and at least have that. And so he lets her go. And that's the part of the story I wish was written down. How did she spend those two months? She's clearly not the author of the story, so I have to wonder if she was so agreeable and so calm and willing. This is a story about a woman whose body is not respected, not honored, killed in the name of God, even though God did not ask for that. God never asked for that deal. I'm sad that she doesn't have a name, but I do know that in her father's house in heaven, she has a name and her father in heaven would never strike a deal in which she is physically sacrificed for a different kind of victory. And that gives me a little bit of comfort that in this world where we are quick to barter and make deals for the sake of the short term, God is functioning in Kairos time and thinking about the whole picture and moving through time and space um, for the sake of salvation, which doesn't always look like winning. Sometimes it doesn't look anything like winning. So I invite you to spend some time with Jephthah's daughter, maybe give her a name, and wonder what she knows about exile and what she might have to teach us about what it means to be wild and free and crossing boundaries and 
moving into the unknown and the discomfort that is exile.